everyone. Welcome to Made to Dream. I'm your host, Maya Chanel, and here we share stories from women around the world to inspire, encourage, and empower women and young girls to dream without limitations. Today, I have the ultimate pleasure of speaking with Ms. Heather Burright, and she is the CEO of Skill Masters Market. So I'm excited to know a little bit more about what that is, what she does, and how she got here along her journey. So hi, Heather. How are you doing today? Hi, I'm good. How are you? Thank you for having me. I'm great. Thank you for being here. Thank you for sharing your story with our audience. I want to let you know, um, let you go ahead and let the audience know a little bit more about yourself and what you do. Sure. So I have um, about 15 years of experience in the learning and development space. I like to say on the people side of organizations. Mm -hmm. So uh, basically it's the non-compliance side of HR. It's the fun side. And <laughs> uh, so, <laughs> so I do work around onboarding and competency models uh, and learning and coaching and all of those fun things that HR gets to deal with. No mm -hmm. employment law for me. Um, so my, my last, uh, quote unquote corporate role was for a national nonprofit where I identified the competencies that people needed. Competencies are, are skills. A lot of times they're leadership skills or soft skills. Mm. Um, and I would identify the competencies that people would need to be successful throughout their career with it, with the organization, whether they were mm. um, a frontline part-time staff person. Um, many times those were uh, teenagers or young adults. Uh, and then mm. all the way through um, C-suites that were, you know, leading organizations and making um, big financial decisions and setting strategy and vision for mm -hmm. the organization as well. Um, and as part of that role, I um, also did uh, coaching. I owned part of the coaching program that they had. And so mm -hmm. I just led those initiatives and fell in love with the idea of coaching. I went out on my own and started my own consulting business in May of this year. And I knew my consulting business focuses on organizations, um, small to mid-sized organizations, mostly nonprofits. Um, mm -hmm. And I, I focus on learning and development mostly with them. Um, but I knew when I started this business, I also wanted to do career coaching for women who were seeking a career change because oftentimes that comes with a lot of fear and a lot of doubt, uh, maybe a lack of clarity around what that might look like. And it's just a soft spot for me that I really wanted to um, dig in and help women. Um, I think that people are happiest when their careers align with their values and their mm -hmm. capabilities. And so being able to work on the organization side and helping mm -hmm. organizations create the environment and the opportunities that people need to thrive, but then also working directly with women and, and helping them find those career paths that really align with their values and capabilities really for me is a sweet spot and something I just enjoy doing. I love it. I love it. And I totally agree. You know, sometimes we focus more on what a career is and the task of that career rather than is this something that I enjoy doing? Is it something that fits with my lifestyle? Is it something that fits with me personally? So I think that's a great aspect to focus on. Um, I know you started um, in HR, right? And then you moved to consulting. Do you still do HR at the same time as you're consulting? Or? I am a full-time consultant I'm working mostly with HR leaders. OK. So. How did you find yourself into the space of HR? It's very interesting to know because I know a lot of people think that, oh, I want to get here, but sometimes there's different stepping stones to get to this, this certain place in your life or on your journey. So how did you get to HR? And, you know, we already saw the journey of how it led you to consulting. So how did you start in HR yeah. and find your pathway there? Yeah, so um, it's interesting. When I first graduated from college, I feel like I fell into a career path. Uh, it was mm -hmm. not an intentional decision. I went to college. I changed my major four or five times. I can't mm -hmm. really keep there, done that. <laughs> <laughs> and, and and then I graduated, and I was like, I, I ended up in it with an English major. And I graduated, mm -hmm. and I'm like, it's so open ended. I can do anything I want. And I realized that I could do nothing because I had no idea what I wanted to do, and my <laughs> degree was so open ended. And so mm -hmm. I, I I picked. Uh, I, what's it called? I kicked the ball down the court a little bit and uh, mm -hmm. went to grad school instead where I got a master's in English, which was no more helpful than the bachelor's <laughs> in English. <laughs> and, uh, and when I finished my master's, I'm like, okay, I'm not going for a PhD. I have to figure out what I'm going to do. So let mm -hmm. me find a job. Um, and it really was for me at that point about finding a job. Um, mm -hmm. I, I found a job that was um, focused on editing but for a curriculum department. So mm -hmm. uh, the group was building training for people. And uh, I fell in love with that idea of training. 
So I fell into an instructional design type mm -hmm. of environment and followed that path for many years. Um, it wasn't until I had my um, first child that I realized I needed to be more intentional with my career path. It was the first time mm -hmm. I had really felt a conflict uh, between what I was doing and some of my core values that I held. And perhaps mm -hmm. my values shifted a little bit with, with having children as well. Um, right. But I knew suddenly I wanted my work to be meaningful. I needed flexibility. Um, I had all of these things that um, I wanted to be intentional about pursuing. And so mm -hmm. when an opportunity came up to transition into a more competency focused role, as opposed to just training, um, mm -hmm. I knew that I needed to either one, incorporate that into my current position or prepare myself to move into that type of position. Mm -hmm. um, when I talked to my supervisor about it, again, taking on this new persona of being really intentional <laughs> about my career, I went to my supervisor and I said, I'm interested in this particular role. Uh, mm -hmm. I think I could incorporate it into my current role in this way. And she said, you need to apply for that other role. And mm -hmm. so I <laughs> took her advice and uh, ended up doing um, competencies where I was able to look at the full talent life cycle as opposed to just the training piece. So then I was right. able to say, these are the, the leadership skills that people are going to need to be successful. Now, how do we help HR leaders hire with those skills in mind? How do we onboard in a way that's really intentional, that helps people know what the expectations are as they join the organization? And then mm -hmm. how do we develop them over time, not just through training, but through mm -hmm. hands-on experiences, through mentorship and coaching, um, formal training, education, whatever that looks like. And so really looking from, you know, point A to point Z, I guess, in this case, throughout that full talent life cycle, what is it that people need to be successful? Now, is this something that you help to create within the company or is it something tailored specifically to that company or is it something HR that is like known worldwide? Yeah, so, so many organizations use competency models. Uh, to mm -hmm. what extent probably varies um, based on the organization. For the organization that I was with, uh, it was a, a custom proprietary competency model. It wasn't off the shelf. You can actually mm -hmm. buy off the shelf competency models. And so mm -hmm. some organizations go that route and say, we just need a competency model. Let's go buy one and figure out what applies to us. Uh, and mm -hmm. some organizations do the more custom approach and build one for themselves. Um, mm -hmm. But yeah, I would say most, at least larger organizations uh, have competency models in place. So I know that you talked about how after college, it was kind of difficult for you to really know what it was that you wanted to do or what was fulfilling for you in your life. Um, being in an HR space, how would you say you've been able to help others who have come after you or a way that you can help others within that space to avoid certain things like that? Yeah, I think definitely uh, with the coaching piece of it. And um, I certainly did that in my, in my role uh, with, you know, an organization and I uh, find myself doing it now more as a career coach um, for mm -hmm. women. Um, I think for me, it's about identifying your life vision because your career is part of your life. Um, and mm -hmm. so it shouldn't be these two competing things, which is where we find problems with work-life balance. You mm -hmm. should have a life vision um, and your career is one piece of that. Um, and then identifying a person's core values. Again, I, I mentioned when I had a baby, suddenly I needed more meaning in my work and I mm -hmm. wanted more flexibility. Those were mm -hmm. some core values that I have. And mm -hmm. those became apparent when I had mm -hmm. my first child. And so um, identifying your core values helps you identify uh, types of positions or career paths that will align for you and also organizations because there are also mm -hmm. things to consider. Um, I like to say if you if you value stability, a mm -hmm. startup is probably not the place for you because things are constantly changing and evolving right. and they're innovating. And so that might not be a good thing ready for to you. Get down with the dirty. <laughs> right, right, exactly. Uh, you may you may have a value around adventure. And so, um, you know, finding an organization that allows you uh, some flexibility with that allows you to travel, um, you know, whatever that looks like for you, that can be a really good thing. And so identifying what your, your life vision is and your values are, are key. And then the last piece, I, when I'm working with women who are changing careers, the last piece I add is transferable skills. Um, mm -hmm. if, you're, if you're changing any type of job or career, you're going to want to know what that is. But if you're changing co industries completely, that becomes mm -hmm. an even more important piece. And that's right. similar to the competency work that I did in my previous role. 
Um, mm -hmm. Because if you can identify your transferable skills, often they are not those technical skills. They are not um, the hard skills. They are the soft mm -hmm. skills. So for example, if you're a nurse and you're going to transfer into education, you're probably not going to be giving people injections in education. And so that's a technical <laughs> skill that you're not going to necessarily take with you. Right. Um, but you probably have soft skills about how you interacted with your patients, how you cared for them, that those will transfer into education. Yeah, so for me, it's definitely. vision, values, and skills. No, definitely. I think it's important to, I think a lot of people aren't looking at the aspect of lifestyle. And for me, all my life, you know, my listeners have probably already heard this a million times, but all my life, <laughs> I was, you know, on this track to become a doctor, a surgeon to be specific. And as I grew older, it didn't become apparent to me to kind of ask questions more about lifestyle rather than the career. Because all my life, I'm like, oh, what does this person do? What does this person do? What is your role? But it wasn't like me asking the day to day life until I got all these mentors and I would see them doing this and this and that. And I'm like, how is your lifestyle with this? And, you know, they're telling me all these different things. I'm like, wait a minute, wait a minute. Like, let me back up for a second. Do I really want to get myself into this? And I think that's a really important key factor that needs to be, you know, standardized for everyone considering a type of career. It is. And it's one of the things actually that I, uh, when I'm working with career coaching clients, it's one of the things I have them do. So I'm super impressed and proud that you're having these conversations with your mentors. Um, mm -hmm. I think when women often doubt themselves, they have a fear of making a career change. Um, one, they don't have the clarity, but two, they don't have the confidence or the courage necessarily to make that change happen. And so, like you said, after I've had them identify their vision and their values and their skills, and they start to think about what careers might actually be a good fit for them, um, my mm -hmm. next step for them is to have them do informational interviews as well as just kind of online research. But the mm -hmm. informational interviews are key because then you can go to somebody who's already in that type of role and you can ask them about their day to day and you can right. understand better if that type of career path will actually align with that life vision and mm -hmm. those values and those skills that you've identified. So you can be mm -hmm. really intentional with those questions that you're asking them um, to make sure that you're choosing a career path that will fit and that will um, align with the things that you need it to align with so that you feel happier and more fulfilled. Right, most definitely. Now, you know, we're talking about on this show, encouraging women to just dream without limitations. Some of your female clients that you've, ha you've had to deal with, um, you know, as women, sometimes we can, you know, self-doubt ourselves sometimes or sell ourselves a little bit short. So how do you deal with clients who have self-limiting beliefs or who sell themselves a little bit too short in their, in their transition? Yeah, so a couple of things. One, I try to uh, to call it. When I see a limiting belief happening, um, mm -hmm. I try to call that out um, just so they're aware of it. Uh, what mm -hmm. they do with that, obviously, is on them. I can't change right. a limiting belief for someone, <laughs> um, but at least they're aware of it. Mm -hmm. um, I also think I, I like to ask the question at some point during the process, if you knew you couldn't fail, failure mm -hmm. is off the table, what would you do? And then when they've answered, dissect why that hasn't been an option for them in the past, because then mm -hmm. you'll start to uncover some of those limiting beliefs as well. Right. Um, I do uh, a little bit around, depending on the needs of the, the individual client, um, mm -hmm. I have provided you know, journal prompts, gratitude journal prompts to keep the mindset positive. I've done affirmations for clients so that they're um, you know, constantly and, and on a daily basis reminding themselves of everything they have to offer the world. Um, mm -hmm. And then once they've made a decision for a career path, um, for me, it's about SMART goals and how do you set some very specific goals to help you achieve whatever that transition looks like for you. Mm -hmm. um, and then also looking at what is your, I don't know if you've ever heard of the book, um, The Four Tendencies by Gretchen Rubin, um, mm -hmm. but she has a quiz, a free quiz on online that um, will tell you what your tendencies are. And mm -hmm. um, it's really good for making change happen, right? We all mm -hmm. view change differently. If you think about the person who sets the new year's resolution and immediately mm -hmm. follows through and has a whole new lifestyle. And then you mm -hmm. think about the person who sets the new year's resolution and then nothing happens. Or you think about the person who will never set a new year's resolution. Right. <laughs> and so, and so we for those that set it and then it's like they do it for the first week. And then after that is done. We already know the gyms are packed the first two right. weeks. 
of the yes. year. After that, yes. you're good to go. <laughs> yes. And I'm sure you see that when you're working with people in the in the fitness space. Yes. Um, so we all have these tendencies towards actual behavior change. And so working with, with women to set goals, but then also to take into account what their tendencies are um, mm -hmm. is really important. <laughs> no, most definitely. So what would you say are some of the biggest lessons that you've learned along your entire journey from start to where you are now? You know, we're constantly growing. So what are some of the lessons that you've learned along your journey? Yeah, I think for me, there's, it's mostly about intentionality. Um, mm -hmm. You know, I, I joked that I fell into my career path originally, right? But I wasn't intentional. When I went mm -hmm. to college, I wasn't intentional. Um, I felt like in high school, I had only been presented with the basics, right? Like you can be a yes. teacher or you can be a nurse. Teacher, a doctor. nurse, doctor, like it was, lawyer, <laughs> engineer, that's it. <laughs> right. And so when I didn't want to be any of those things, I was left confused about what, what else there was. And I wasn't intentional to, to do the work to, to identify what those options were. Mm -hmm. And so I kind of floated, so to speak, through college in order to just get a degree because that's what I was supposed to do. And then I right. graduated. Okay, I'll go get another degree. So just <laughs> there was just a lack of intentionality. And, mm -hmm. and I don't regret like I, you know, degrees um, can be can be really helpful depending on the field that you're going into, right? So mm -hmm. I don't regret getting a bachelor's or a master's. And I don't think anybody actually cares that it's in English, um, right. even though it's not necessarily <laughs> something Listen, I, I heard on a daily basis. Just just a tip that I've heard, you can get a bachelor's degree in history and still be accepted into med school. That yeah. really just blew my entire mind. I was like, why did I waste my time doing this? I could have just like right. skated through bachelor's. Right. Who needs a pre-med? Um, yeah. So, you know, I think it's just intentionality and, and that takes time. Um, and that's something that I think uh, many people don't prioritize. Uh, mm -hmm. Time is that, that resource that we never have enough of. And so if right. we don't have the accountability, um, often we won't take that time to be intentional. Mm -hmm. Most definitely. I totally agree. Um, so, you know, I know that you talked about how your values change over time as you became more intentional. How did your definition of success change from the time where, you know, you were younger, let's say you just were not really exposed to the world because who we really aren't exposed to the world until we actually get out there. That's why we don't really know what we want to do most of the time because we, we don't explore. So from the time, you know, way back when until you were the point you are in your journey right now, your definition of success. Yeah, that's an interesting question. Since I wasn't intentional about it before, I don't know that I had a specific definition of success. I think mm -hmm. if I had to, you know, reflect and define it, it would have been probably just about comfort and lifestyle as opposed mm -hmm. to a specific measurable thing, um, mm -hmm. which measurable is important um, mm -hmm. for the record. <laughs> and so, <laughs> so I don't know that I would have had, you know, something that I could point to now and say, okay, I've met my definition of success from mm -hmm. childhood or adolescence. Um, but, you know, now I think, um, you know, I'm building, I'm building a business and I have a completely different mindset around what success looks like. Um, mm -hmm. And for me, there are, um, you know, financial indicators and things like that. But mm -hmm. I think it's, it's about um, setting a vision, whatever that mm -hmm. vision is, and working hard towards achieving it. There will always be things that are outside of my control. Mm -hmm. Um, and so whether or not I actually achieve that vision, um, I can't say that that is success, right? right. There will always be things that I can't control, right. but if I am being intentional and I'm working hard towards achieving that vision, then I find that to be success. Most definitely, you know, setting your intentions, setting your goals and just reaching for them. I think that in itself is success in it. Um, because a lot of people say that they're going to do something like we talked about the new year's resolution and just yeah. being able to accomplish that, I feel like is successful. I, I tell people all the time, if you want to create a magazine, go for it. Even if it's not one of the best sellers on the front of the newsstands, <laughs> create that magazine because at the end of the day, you only have one life to live, do everything yeah. that fulfills you, gives you passion and gives you purpose. So um, yeah, I love that. So if you had to say one thing to women and girls around the world to inspire them to dream without limitations, what would it be? 
you can do it. I mean, I think so often we are putting those limiting beliefs on ourselves mm -hmm. and there it's us We're we are our biggest factor in yeah. success. Um, and so you can do it, but you have to try. I love it. I love it. So before we end, I want to give you the opportunity to allow the audience to know how they can reach you for services. If they just want to follow your journey, how can they do that? Yeah. So um, for career coaching, I am on Instagram and Facebook under at it's her beautiful story. Love it. It's beautiful. Awesome. So we'll have those in the show notes as well as always. And we thank you so much, Heather, for sharing your story with us today being an inspiration, encouragement, and just empowering women around the world. We thank everyone once again for tuning in to Made to Dream. I'm your host, Maya Chanel, and we'll see you next time.